Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Anybody happy summer is here? Any teachers happy this Sunday is here? Summer, summer? They like, thank you, Holy Ghost. I've been praying. I know it. I know it. All right. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. We're going to start at verse 36. It reads like this. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. And when a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she began to wipe them off with her hair. Somebody say, with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, I love this part, because oftentimes people who want to talk about you never say anything to you. They just say it to themselves. Isn't that, isn't that, isn't anybody can testify to that? So people, people think a whole lot of stuff, but they never articulate it to you. Here's what the Pharisee said. He thought to himself, he said to himself, if this man were really a prophet talking about Jesus, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered, I love this, his thoughts. Didn't answer his words, Trey. He answered his thoughts. I'm going to read some more of this passage in a second because I think Jesus' answer uh, to this particular Pharisee is helpful for all of us. But before we get there, before we get there, I, I just want to preach from the sermon title today, uh, House Party. Can you just tell your neighbor House Party? Come on, just find one other person and say House Party, House Party, House Party. Now let's catch up. I just want to catch up for a moment. We're going to talk about house parties in just a moment. I know all y'all been saved all your life. You've never been to one. But, uh, you know. For the few of us who've been saved by grace. Amen. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about house parties. But before I get there, I want to bring everybody up to speed. I want to talk about what we've been talking about in this series about kingdom. We've been talking about the concept of kingdom. And I asked a series of questions when we started this particular series. They, they all are important questions that you should ask yourself. And so I don't want to assume that you've been here every week. And I want to give you some of those questions. Uh, the first question was, what is the purpose? Answers today. Salvation. What is the purpose of salvation? And I asked you these questions a few weeks ago, but I'm going to give you some answers today. Uh, uh, I hope that you've gotten some through Bible study and through service. But, but one of the answers to this question, I believe, is the purpose of salvation is not just to get to heaven. But the purpose of salvation is so that we can exhibit the kingdom lifestyle here on earth. I've been saying this week after week that our call, our assignment as kingdom representatives is to bring heaven's systems, heaven's principles, heaven's practices to earth. Y'all with me? Second question was, why was Jesus crucified? Most people say because he was the son of God, but that really wasn't the issue. The issue was any time a kingdom is introduced, systems are introduced. And what Jesus does is he comes to earth and introduces a different way of doing things. He introduces a system that, that, that was uneasy for the politicians at the time. He introduces a system that was not comfortable for the religious leaders at the time. He introduced a system of love and kindness and peace and patience and, and non-judgmental attitudes and, and just loving on people. He introduced a system that nobody had ever experienced before. And so what happened was people got upset because the system that Jesus introduced, the way of living, the way of loving, the way of his lifestyle, it bothered them because it messed up the way they were doing things. And so they said, hey, he got to go. He messing with our money. He, he messing with our systems. He's messing with, with how we do things. We got power. We got control. We got authority. And he's jacking some stuff up. We got we to get rid of Jesus. Jesus' reason for being crucified was because he was in the way. Look at your neighbors. He was in the way. Here's another question, though. Here's another question that we pose, and I think it's an important one. What should we care about most as kingdom representatives? What should we care about most? As followers of Christ, what should we care about most as proclaimed Christians? And I think the message is really simple. We should care about the kingdom. We should care about people hearing that God loves them no matter what. Can I, can I be honest with y'all? One of the most interesting things I think in the world 
is that is that we have a culture now where we live and breed hate more than love. And the kingdom message is so contrary to that. It's I don't care what you did. I still love you. And, I, and you talked about me. I still love you. A Bible study on Tuesday, we talked about this passage that's so familiar to us. If somebody hits you on one cheek, turn to give them the other cheek. And many people was like, the devil is a liar. That's not my testimony. I'm not called to that ministry. Everybody got a different calling. That's not mine's. But the true difficulty of the gospel, the true difficulty of the kingdom lifestyle is not just in what you wear and where you go and how you talk and what music you listen to. The real difficulty is how do you love people that are unlovable? How do you associate with people who, who when you know that guilt by association will occur, that people are going to talk about you, that people are going to have something to point the finger at? How, how do you learn to be in the presence? How do you sacrifice what you love for what you want most, which is honoring Jesus? How do you, you, you sacrifice or change your values? The last thing I want to help, when you say what I want most is what God wants most, how do we do that? That's the kingdom message. Here's the last thing I want to help you with, though. It's kingdom is a, a way of living. It's a system. And we've been talking about how the system, the system, the system of kingdom living is not necessarily easy, but it is necessary. That kingdom is about when any kingdom takes over another kingdom, they introduce a way of doing things. A way of doing things. Anybody ever had a new boss show up to your job and you were comfortable in some ways of doing things? But it was their job to come in and tighten up ship, to, to, to pull the reins in. You were used to being able to just control your own schedule. Now they're like, but I need you to communicate with me. Ain't nobody, I didn't have to communicate with nobody last year. Your job. I left when I wanted to left. I came when I wanted to come. Left when I wanted to leave. Y'all know what I was trying to say. That's the problem with y'all. Y'all spirit off. Y'all pay attention to the wrong stuff. Kingdom, Amen. And here it is, Jesus introduces a system, a new way of doing things. He says, I know what y'all done heard, I know what y'all been doing. And, and I want to suggest today that one of the greatest, the greatest challenges, and I love what Jesus shows us in this passage, one of the greatest dangers of American Christianity and church is our ability to celebrate titles but not transformation. Somebody needs to catch that before you go. This is really good stuff. You, you, you are in a dangerous place when we start celebrating the fact that you call yourself a Christian. But nothing has changed about your life. Like, I have the title, but there's been no transformation in my attitude. I have the title, but there's been no transformation in how I respond to conflict. I have the title, but there's been no transformation in how I spend my money. I have the title, but there's been no transformation in my peace. So I'm still frustrated, and I'm still depressed, and I'm still tired, and I'm still crying about the same Negroes and the same females and the same people. I know y'all ain't going to say amen today. But every now and then, somebody should say, I don't just affirm your title. I appreciate the fact that you walk down the middle aisle. I love the fact that you call yourself a Christian. But what has been transformed in the way that you live? It's easy to celebrate the title. Because we see that. But do people see the transformation at your job and at your family reunion? You know, we love to give ourselves a pass at the family reunion. I'm just with my family, being myself. But something about us should be evolving and changed. And, and, and I think this woman in this passage helps us to understand this at a greater level. I think she shows us some great insight. Can we talk about this woman for a minute? This woman is amazing to me uh, because she hears... There's a house party going on. Now, 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 when I think about a house party, I, I'm like many of y'all, I think about kid and play. Can we just go there for a second? I think about kid and play. This, this, this is the image that pops in my head. Anybody seen house party? Anybody seen house party two? House party three? House party four? Five? Six? That's how you know you ain't no real fan. There ain't no six. House party. It was a great movie. You know, we all, we all left with dances. And, and, and some of us, some of us even embodied this movie. I, I'm going to tell this story. He didn't know I was going to tell it. Uh, but, but, you know, but Chris, since I always come at you and, and, and I, gotta, I always talk about Norfolk, I'm not going to talk about you today, Chris. I'm talking about Jeff. When we was in college, Jeff invited me to a house party. I was, a, I was a sophomore, 
Jeff was a super senior. <laughs> For those who don't know what that means, it means he just wanted to get the whole experience. He didn't want to rush it. He wanted to embody it. And, uh, and I remember being, being invited to this house party, and I remember noticing several things. Noticing several things. I, I remember some things got damaged that I'm sure were not in the plan. You know, everybody who's throwing a house party knows there's just a slight chance that something might get broke. And what makes you mad is you might not know who broke it. There might be some stains in some places that you know the carpet was clean in. Somebody spilt something. I ain't saying what was in the red cup. I'm just saying something spilt. And it just seems to happen at house parties. But, but more than all of that, I think the most interesting thing about a house party that I remember was that there were many uninvited guests. I mean, it just seems like people are heard about what was going on and just start showing up. And I think this woman is so interesting because she reminds me a lot of how a house party works. She heard that there was a big cookout. Burst. Shots. And uh, Phil Mob shots out. Uh. <laughs> And she said, I got to go because, because what I've heard and, and what I've seen and what I've experienced and they've been talking about who's going to be there in the atmosphere and the environment. And I just can't miss the opportunity to be there. And, I, and so they invite themselves. And I wonder what if many of us thought about Jesus the same way. Like, 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 like wherever he is. I don't want to miss it. Like, 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 wherever he's going to be, I just got to be there. Like, 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 I don't just want to want to be anywhere. I want to be where Jesus is because I heard that whenever he shows up to a party, it is memorable. And whenever he shows up to a party, people change. And whenever he shows up to a party, something happens that you can't even explain. The first party he showed up to, he turned water to wine. He showed up to a couple other parties and, and he made people raised from the dead. And I just heard that if I get to where he is, that my life can be changed. And so I'm not waiting for a Facebook invite. I'm not waiting for, for something in the mail. I'm not waiting for an invitation. She invites herself to this house gathering to experience the presence of Jesus. She, she shows us a lot. I think it's very interesting in this passage that this woman doesn't say a word. People are talking about her. They're thinking things about her. She never responds to the people who are bothered by her presence. She, 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 she doesn't say a word. She doesn't sing a word. She doesn't, she doesn't do anything. She doesn't shout. The only thing she does is say she brought something with her. And I want to look at that today because I think it helps us to understand the big deal. Everybody say the big deal. I, I want to give you three points today, but, but they're, they're kind of general and they're not, they're not going to be one word and rhyming. But I think they're going to help us to understand the big deal of what uh, the expectation for our lives is when we get into the presence of a kingdom changer. So here's the first one. Here's the first one. It starts with intimacy. Everybody say it starts. Now, now what starts? That's the question you got to ask here for this question. What starts is a new relationship. I, I, I want so badly for us to become the type of Christians where we are so deep into our relationship with God. That it's not just a church experience, but it is a life experience. And many of us, the reason why we become dull in our Christianity or become less excited or we just, okay, I'm supposed to go to church or whatever. I, I love the fact that one writer says, he says, there's a big difference between I got to go and I get to go. A lot of us still have I got to go mentality. Man, I got to go to church today. But when you say, man, I'm so excited, I get to go, there's a fresh intimacy. When you meet a person for the first time and you, you know, you start talking to them and you're like, you know, I'm, I'm excited. I get to go out on a date with them. I get to go out, meet their family. I get to go. I get to. But when you start saying, I got, man, I got to take her something to eat, she, she acting sick. <laughs> Come on. Anybody experienced that transition before in your relationship? Oh, that, she called me again. I got to go, dog. I'm going to just have to watch the fourth quarter. On the phone no more. I got to do it. But it used to be, I get it, it used to be your boys couldn't even get you on the phone no more. They'd be like, you with her, ain't you? Yeah, I was chilling. <laughs> I gotta versus I get to. 
And I think sometimes what's happened in our intimacy with God is we've lost intimacy uh, b- b- because we don't understand how to create it. This woman helps us to understand how we create intimacy with God. She doesn't say anything. See, some of us, our greatest challenges, we're trying to create intimacy with our words. And some of us can testify that it really doesn't work like that in relationships because I can say I love you. But intimacy is not birthed by what I say. It's by what I sacrifice. See, we can't really have an intimate conversation if I'm trying to talk to you while I'm on my phone. We can have a conversation, but it is not intimate. And so many of us, the reason why we're missing God is because we're always distracted and we're always busy. And we're not really creating time to be intimate with God. We're just, and and we, what we've done is we've misperceived some things because there's a difference between being active and being intimate. So we're jumping, but we're still not creating time for intimacy. We're singing, but we're not creating time for intimacy. And it's important that if we're going to go to the next stage in our relationship, we have to understand if we want to go deeper, if we want our relationship to remain fresh, if we want it to remain exciting, if we want it to mean more than Sunday morning, we have to go into a deeper level of intimacy. And intimacy can only be created by sacrifice. Pure intimacy is the product of sacrifice. This woman brings to him an intimate gift. It says she had an alabaster jar. Can I explain to you the alabaster jar? The alabaster jar was something that a teenage girl would be given early in her teenage years by a parent, and it was important that you understand it was given to her as a representation of her purity. And so what would happen is a young girl would get this alabaster jar from a father or a family member, and she would keep it concealed until the time of the night of her marriage for her consummation. And then she would break the jar open and spread it over the the bed or over herself as a sweet smelling fragrance to her spouse. So here it is. The thing that she offers to Jesus is the thing that represents her greatest moment of intimacy. It is the most valuable thing she possesses as a woman in the time that she lives in. And she says, Jesus, I would rather have you than to have them. Y'all missed it over here. For some of us, the reason why we can't go to the deepest level of intimacy with God, the reason why our relationship has become dull, the reason why we're not still excited and still passionate is because we want to be comfortable giving God something that we don't even value. So we spend time arguing with God. God, I gave you that, but that ain't what you value. God, I showed up and served, but that ain't what you value. What I want is what you value, because until you can give me what you value, we can be active together, but we still won't be intimate together. Not only does she offer him the alabaster jar, which contains the perfume and the fragrance that represent her intimate moment, but she also offers him something else. It wipes her feet, his feet, with her hair. Now, why is that significant? Because in biblical times, a woman would keep her hair covered until the night of her marriage. So then when they came time to consume, she would reveal her hair as a part of her beauty. He would, she would reveal that part of herself, that beautiful part of herself at the time of her husband's consummation with her. So she chooses to give him another piece of intimacy, a hidden piece. I wonder how many of us not only are not giving him the valuable piece, but we also won't give him the hidden piece of us. A piece that we don't tell people about piece that we're, we're even scared to talk about, the piece that we've been battling for years, the piece that, that we know is connected to our history and our bitterness and our pain, the piece that, that, that we know we did, but we don't want to re- relive it. What piece of us are we hiding from God? And he said, if you reveal it, we will step into a deeper level of intimacy. The reason why many of us don't have great prayer lives because we think God wants to hear us quote scriptures. So we start off our prayer, dearly and most holy father of most high God, we come to you now. Seeking to only know you how you may be found. Speaking in words we won't even know. Instead, God said, how about you try next time you pray. Try this tonight. Try this tomorrow. Try having a conversation with me about the, the hidden parts of your life. The parts that nobody sees when you show up to church, the, the way you treat people, the integrity issue, the, the thing that you've been trying to stop doing, but every time you try, you keep getting sucked back into it. What part of you is hidden? And that's the part that God wants to talk about. It's an intimate 
at. And if you're going to step into a deeper relationship with God, it starts with intimacy. Everybody say it starts with intimacy. But here's the other thing you got to understand. The second thing I need you to understand is that it is sustained by grace. Everybody say grace. Now, now it's one thing to start something. Some of us can testify as sustaining it. Starting something is easy. Sustaining it can be difficult. And we could run down the list of things that we've started in our lives but haven't sustained. For some of us, it's been chores around the house. Can we start light? I'm a, you know, I'm going to cook three times a week, and I'm going for two weeks. For some of us, it's workout. For some of us, it's a little greater. For some of us, it's how we treat people. And for some of us, we say, you know, I'm going to start off this year. I'm going to be the best employee at my job. I'm going to be on time to work. I'm going to work hard. I ain't going to be in group me. I ain't going to be on Facebook. And then the devil is alive. It's the end of the school year, and I be looking at y'all like, they ain't working. We start things, but sustaining this habit is difficult. Here's the same thing that happens with us with God. We try to sustain our relationship through our work sometimes. Me and Zach talk about this all the time. We try to say, if I just do a little more, if I serve on Fifth Sunday, if I just, if I just treat a little more people nice, do this. And we think that we're being sustained by what we do. Here's what I love about Jesus. It doesn't matter how much we do. It says our righteousness is as filthy rags. But we're sustained by his grace for us. What sustains our relationship with him is not how good we become, how, how, how much we do well, but what sustains it is the fact that he loves you in spite of when you mess up, that he loves you in spite of when you can't figure it out. And Jesus helps us to understand this in his response to the woman's opposers. Let, let, let's look at that for a moment. Uh, go to verse 41 for me. I think it was 41. Let's go back where we stopped, wherever that was. So interesting. Jesus answers the man's thoughts, and here's what he chooses to tell them. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to another, but neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both. Canceling their debts, who do you suppose loved more after that? Now, this is Jesus talking to the Pharisee, and he answered. His name was Simon. I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. And so he says, then he turned to the woman and said, this woman kneeling here, when I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet. When I entered your home, she did what you didn't do. She washed them with her tears and wiped them with the most intimate part of her life. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with her rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven, so she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. And the men at the table said, who is this man who introduces this system, this kingdom thing, this way of doing things. Can I tell you what I'm excited about? He helps me to understand something about my life, that the fact that I messed up a little more than somebody else, the fact that I made a little bit more mistakes than somebody else, the fact that I just got some things wrong a lot more than some other people does not make me less of a Christian. All it means is that I'm more equipped to love some people who are struggling with some stuff like me. He says, hey, I know this woman has many sins, but because of where she comes from, she'll understand how to love people better. It doesn't matter if you did it 10 times or if you did it two times. It doesn't matter if you did it for three years or if you did it for one year. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you never knew about God to last week or if you've been knowing about him all your life. All that matters is that the debt is canceled because his grace is sufficient for every stronghold and every struggle and every sin. And when you get to that place where you understand that it's all about his grace, that that sustains the relationship. Some of us know about people who are in relationship, and it's not because things are going pretty right now, and it's not because things are going great, and it's not because things are ideal. It's just because I'm not going to give up on you because I love you, and I love the fact that Jesus loves me the same way. And he says, you're not always ideal, and you're not always perfect, and you're not always in perspective, and you're not always in alignment. You're not always listening. You're not always showing me the love that I show you, but my grace will sustain this relationship. I won't give up on you if you don't give up on me. His grace sustains us. But here's the last thing that I think we got to understand. Are y'all doing okay? Because he, she comes to this house party, and she experiences not only 
an intimate moment with Jesus, but then she also moves into a grace moment with Jesus, and then she, she, she does this thing that I think is amazing. It's best shared through lifestyle. We've been talking about kingdom as a system or way of living, and you can't spread the kingdom message through just what you say. You got to do it through what you serve and what you sacrifice. It's best shared through lifestyle. Look at what Jesus says to this woman at the very end of this piece. Go back to the scripture right where we were at. He tells this woman something so significant, and if you capture this, you'll capture, I think, the best part of your life. He says, and Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Everybody say saved you. And he says, go in peace. Now, this Greek actually right here is, is, is stated a little differently. In the Greek, it says, go into your peace, meaning step into a better life. Step into less frustration. Step into more excitement about what the world has to offer. Step into the next chapter of your life. Can I tell you something? The thing that many of you have been waiting on, you've been expecting Christianity to do something for you, but really it's not about how many services you go to and how many songs you know and how many scriptures. I want you to understand today what Jesus is waiting on for you is to just have enough faith to step into the new life that he has for you. But some of you have been so held up for so long. You've been so scared for so long. You've been made to feel ashamed for so long. You've been made to feel less than for so long spiritually. That now it's time for you to step into your peace. And you can't do it. He tells this woman, go into your peace. Go into the life now that you've been praying for. How many of us, God has already granted us permission to be at peace, but we keep holding on to what was behind us? How many of us has God already granted the privilege and the possibility to walk into new power and new prosperity and new potential and new joy? And I, I said it at the beginning of this year. Some of us, our testimony this year is not going to be that my bank account grew. It's not going to be I got a new job, but I'm just happier this year. I got more peace this year. I got more joy this year. I want people to be looking at me saying, what happened to you this year? I was just happy. Ain't nothing changed about my finances. Ain't nothing changed about my life. I just decided to step into peace. I decided that no matter what happened, God still was for me. I just decided that even when things would go wrong, he still loved me. I just decided that even when I didn't deserve his love, he said his grace would sustain this relationship. And so if he loves me, I don't got to worry about what they think about me. And I don't got to worry about how much money I got. And I don't got to worry about where I can go and the trips I can take. I'm at peace with who God has created me to be. He tells this woman, step into your peace. Step into it. I wonder how many people in this room right now are stuck in a season of frustration because you refuse to step into your peace. You're stuck in a season of hurt and guilt and shame and frustration because you refuse to step into your peace. He tells her, your faith has saved you. Now step into your peace. I want to read one last passage for you. I think it's important. If you would stand on your feet. Go to Colossians for me. So I think it helps us to understand how he saved us. Anybody, anybody ever felt like you were drowning before? I mean, like legit, like water. Few people, few people. Anybody can't swim and that's never going to be your testimony? You'd be like, you ain't got to worry about that because I ain't going out there. I'm just out here for Instagram pictures. <laughs> Amen said, your faith has saved you. Everybody say saved. I used to ask myself this question as a Christian. People always say, I got saved. What does that mean? Saved from what? What did you get saved from? How to be saved? Saved? What does that mean? And this woman, he said, I'm saving you so that you can walk in peace. What did he save her from? A system. Colossians 1 and 9. So we have not stopped praying for you. This is Paul writing to the, the church of Colossus. He said, praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live, everybody say live. The kingdom lifestyle, the systems, the ways of doing things. 
then the way that you live will always honor and pre please the Lord. And your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. We also pray that you will be strengthened with this glorious power so that you will have the endurance and patience you need. Sometimes the system is difficult. Sometimes loving people takes endurance. Sometimes staying faithful to whatever season God has you in takes patience. Paul says, I'm praying for it. And may you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. I love it. Here it is. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness, from the system of thinking, from a way of doing things that would have kept us from experiencing the inheritance of Jesus Christ. He's rescued us from that system of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased your freedom and forgave your sins. Can I suggest today that what salvation is all about, what being saved is all about, is the fact that Jesus jumped in to save us from a system of thinking, a system of living that was destroying us and we didn't even know it. A way of living that is going to keep us below our potential. If you ever look at a lifeguard I'm studying this, they said it's not that the people drowning don't know that they need help. They know they need to get to the shore. But the problem is, Kelly, the current is so heavy that even though they know they need to get to a better place, they're not strong enough to swim their way out of it. They, they know that they're in danger but I'm just not strong enough to swim through the current. And so it keeps pulling me back in. I, I swim forward and it pulls me back in. It's something about the current of darkness. It's something about the way of living that's comfortable. It's something about living in a situation that we've been doing too long that we know we need to get better. We know we need to change some habits. We know we need to do something different. But I'm stuck in the current. And Jesus recognized sending a message wasn't enough. So he said the word became flesh. And he did what no other God, it says, does. He didn't just call from the shore. He jumped into the darkness. Because that's the only way we could be rescued. We were trying to get ourselves out. Some of you have been trying for a long time to get yourself out of stuff. You've been saying, I've been swimming. I've been swimming against the current. I've been trying my hardest. I've been trying to change it. I've been trying to do it, and I just can't figure it out. And I want you to understand today, Jesus said, that's why I jumped in with you. Jumped in because I recognized that there were some things that you couldn't afford. There were some things you weren't strong enough to get away from, but I am jumping in with you. And today, I believe Jesus wants to do the same thing. It said, the woman was immoral. With many sins. But Jesus never treated her that way. Jesus says she's valuable. And we're intimate. And he saves her. From a system. And introduces her. To a kingdom way of living. If you would bow your heads with me for a quick word.